Chapter 20. Then a hothead, whose name was Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjaminite, blew a trumpet and yelled, We want nothing to do with David. Come on, you men of Israel, let's get out of here. He's not our king. So all except Judah and Benjamin turned around and deserted David and followed Sheba. But the men of Judah stayed with their king, accompanying him from the Jordan to Jerusalem. When he arrived at his palace in Jerusalem, the king instructed that his ten wives he had left to keep house should be placed in seclusion. Their needs were to be cared for, he said, but he would no longer sleep with them as his wives. So they remained in virtual widowhood until their deaths. Then the king instructed Amasa to mobilize the army of Judah within three days and to report back at that time. So Amasa went out to notify the troops, but it took him longer than the three days he had been given. Then David said to Abishai, That fellow Sheba is going to hurt us more than Absalom did. Quick, take my bodyguard and chase after him before he gets into a fortified city where we can't reach him. So Abishai and Joab set out after Sheba with an elite guard from Joab's army and the king's own bodyguard. As they arrived at the great stone in Gibeon, they came face to face with Amasa. Joab was wearing his uniform with a dagger strapped to his side. As he stepped forward to greet Amasa, he stealthily slipped the dagger from its sheath. I'm glad to see you, my brother, Joab said, and took him by the beard with his right hand as though to kiss him. Amasa didn't notice the dagger in his left hand, and Joab stabbed him in the stomach with it, so that his bowels gushed out onto the ground. He did not need to strike again, and he died there. Joab and his brother Abishai left him lying there and continued after Sheba. One of Joab's young officers shouted to Amasa's troops, If you are for David, come and follow Joab! But Amasa lay in his blood in the middle of the road, and when Joab's young officers saw that a crowd was gathering around to stare at him, they dragged him off the road into a field and threw a garment over him. With the body out of the way, everyone went on with Joab to capture Sheba. Meanwhile, Sheba had traveled across Israel to mobilize his own clan of Bichri at the city of Abel in Bethmaica. When Joab's forces arrived, they besieged Abel and built a mound to the top of the city wall and began battering it down. But a wise woman in the city called out to Joab. Listen to me, Joab. Come over here so I can talk to you. As he approached, the woman asked, Are you Joab? I am. There used to be a saying, If you want to settle an argument, ask advice at Abel, for we always give wise counsel. You are destroying an ancient, peace-loving city loyal to Israel. Should you destroy what is the Lord's? That isn't it at all. All I want is a man named Sheba from the hill country of Ephraim who has revolted against King David. If you will deliver him to me, we will leave the city in peace. All right. We will throw his head over the wall to you. Then the woman went to the people with her wise advice. And they cut off Sheba's head and threw it out to Joab. And he blew the trumpet and called his troops back from the attack. And they returned to the king at Jerusalem. Joab was commander-in-chief of the army, and Benaiah was in charge of the king's bodyguard. Adoram was in charge of the forced labor battalions, and Jehoshaphat was the historian who kept the records. Sheba was the secretary, and Zadok and Abiathar were the chief priests. Ira, the J.I. Wright, was David's personal chaplain. Chapter 21 There was a famine during David's reign that lasted year after year for three years, and David spent much time in prayer about it. Then the Lord said, The famine is because of the guilt of Saul and his family, for they murdered the Gibeonites. So King David summoned the Gibeonites. They were not part of Israel, but were what was left of the nation of the Amorites. Israel had sworn not to kill them, but Saul, in his nationalistic zeal, had tried to wipe them out. David asked them, What can I do for you to rid ourselves of this guilt and to induce you to ask God to bless us? Well, money won't do it, and we don't want to see Israelites executed in revenge. What can I do, then? Just tell me, and I will do it for you. Well, then, give us seven of Saul's sons, the sons of the man who did his best to destroy us. We will hang them before the Lord in Gibeon, the city of King Saul. All right. I will do it. He spared Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, who was Saul's grandson, because of the oath between himself and Jonathan. But he gave them the two sons of Rizpah, 
Armoni, and Mephibosheth, who were grandsons of Saul by his wife Aiah. He also gave them the five adopted sons of Michael that she brought up for Saul's daughter Merab, the wife of Adriel. The men of Gibeon impaled them in the mountain before the Lord. So all seven of them died together at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the mother of two of the men, spread sackcloth upon a rock and stayed there through the entire harvest season to prevent the vultures from tearing at their bodies during the day and the wild animals from eating them at night. When David learned what she had done, he arranged for the men's bones to be buried in the grave of Saul's father, Kish. At the same time, he sent a request to the men of Jabesh Gilead, asking them to bring him the bones of Saul and Jonathan. They had stolen their bodies from the public square at Beth Shan, where the Philistines had impaled them after they had died in battle on Mount Gilboa. So their bones were brought to him. Then at last, God answered prayer and ended the famine. Once when the Philistines were at war with Israel, and David and his men were in the thick of the battle, David became weak and exhausted. Ishbi Benob, a giant whose spear tip weighed more than twelve pounds, and who was sporting a new suit of armor, closed in on David, and was about to kill him. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his rescue and killed the Philistine. After that, David's men declared, You are not going out to battle again. Why should we risk snuffing out the light of Israel? Later, during a war with the Philistines at Gob, Sibichai, the Hushathite, killed Saph, another giant. At still another time, and at the same place, Elhanan killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, whose spear handle was as huge as a weaver's beam. And once, when the Philistines and the Israelis were fighting at Gath, a giant with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot defied Israel, and David's nephew Jonathan, the son of David's brother Shemei, killed him. These four were from the tribe of giants in Gath, and were killed by David's troops. Chapter 22 David sang this song to the Lord after he had rescued him from Saul and from all his other enemies. Jehovah is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. I will hide in God, who is my rock and my refuge. He is my shield and my salvation, my refuge and high tower. Thank you, O oh my savior, for saving me from all my enemies. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. He will save me from all my enemies. The waves of death surrounded me. Floods of evil burst upon me. I was trapped and bound by hell and death, but I called upon the Lord in my distress, and he heard me from his temple. My cry reached his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the heavens quaked because of his wrath. Smoke poured from his nostrils, fire leaped from his mouth, and burned up all before him, setting fire to the world. He bent the heavens down and came to earth. He walked upon dark clouds. He rode upon the glorious, on the wings of the wind. Darkness surrounded him, and clouds were thick around him. The earth was radiant with his brightness. The Lord thundered from heaven. The God above all gods gave out a mighty shout. He shot forth his arrows of lightning and routed his enemies. By the blast of his breath was the sea split in two. The bottom of the sea appeared. From above, he rescued me. He drew me out from the waters. He saved me from powerful enemies, from those who hated me and from those who were too strong for me. They came upon me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my salvation. He set me free and rescued me, for I was his delight. The Lord rewarded me for my goodness, for my hands were clean and I have not departed from my God. I knew his laws, and I obeyed them. I was perfect in obedience and kept myself from sin. That is why the Lord has done so much for me, for he sees that I am clean. You are merciful to the merciful. You show your perfections to the blameless. To those who are pure, you show yourself pure, but you destroy those who are evil. You will save those in trouble, but you bring down the haughty. For you watch their every move. O oh Lord, you are my light. You make my darkness bright. By your power, I can crush an army. By your strength, I leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is true. He shields all who hide behind him. Our Lord alone is God. We have no other savior. God is my strong fortress. He has made me safe. 
He causes the good to walk a steady tread like mountain goats upon the rocks. He gives me skill in war and strength to bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You have made wide steps for my feet to keep them from slipping. I have chased my enemies and destroyed them. I did not stop till all were gone. I have destroyed them so that none can rise again. They have fallen beneath my feet, for you have given me strength for the battle and have caused me to subdue all those who rose against me. You have made my enemies turn and run away. I have destroyed them all. They looked in vain for help. They cried to God, but he refused to answer. I beat them into dust. I crushed and scattered them like dust along the streets. You have preserved me from the rebel of my people. You have preserved me as the head of the nations. Foreigners shall serve me and shall quickly submit to me when they hear of my power. They shall lose heart and come trembling from their hiding places. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Praise to him, the rock of my salvation. Blessed be God who destroys those who oppose me and rescues me from my enemies. Yes, you hold me safe above their heads. You deliver me from violence. No wonder I give thanks to you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. He gives wonderful deliverance to his king and shows mercy to his anointed. To David and his family forever. Chapter 23 These are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, speaks. David, the man to whom God gave such wonderful success, David, the anointed of the God of Jacob, David, sweet psalmist of Israel, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The rock of Israel said to me, One shall come who rules righteously, who rules in the fear of God. He shall be as the light of morning, a cloudless sunrise when the tender grass springs forth upon the earth, as sunshine after rain. And it is my family he has chosen. Yes, God has made an everlasting covenant with me. His agreement is eternal, final, sealed. He will constantly look after my safety and success. But the godless are as thorns to be thrown away, for they tear the hand that touches them. One must be armed to chop them down. They shall be burned. These are the names of the top three, the most heroic men in David's army. The first was Jasheb Bathshebeth from Takamon known also as Adeno the Esnite. He once killed 800 men in one battle. Next in rank was Eleazar, the son of Dodo and grandson of Ahohai. He was one of the three men who, with David, held back the Philistines that time when the rest of the Israeli army fled. He killed the Philistines until his hand was too tired to hold his sword, and the Lord gave him a great victory. The rest of the army did not return until it was time to collect the loot. After him was Shammah, the son of Agai, from Harar. Once during a Philistine attack, when all his men deserted him and fled, he stood alone at the center of a field of lentils and beat back the Philistines, and God gave him a great victory. One time when David was living in the cave of Adullam, and the invading Philistines were at the valley of Rephaim, three of the thirty, the top-ranking officers of the Israeli army, went down at harvest time to visit him. David was in the stronghold at the time, for Philistine marauders had occupied the nearby city of Bethlehem. David remarked, How thirsty I am for some of that good water in the city well. The well was near the city gate. So the three men broke through the Philistine ranks and drew water from the well and brought it to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. No, my God. I cannot do it. This is the blood of these men who have risked their lives. Of those three men, Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Zeruiah, was the greatest. Once he took on three hundred of the enemy single-handed and killed them all. It was by such feats that he earned a reputation equal to the three, though he was not actually one of them. But he was the greatest of the thirty, the top-ranking officers of the army, and was their leader. There was also Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a heroic soldier from Kabziel. Benaiah killed two giants, sons of Ariel of Moab. Another time he went down into a pit and, despite the slippery snow on the ground, took on a lion that was caught there and killed it. 
Another time, armed only with a staff, he killed an Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. He wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. These were some of the deeds that gave ben almost as much renown as the top three. He was one of the greatest of the thirty, but was not actually one of the top three. And David made him chief of his bodyguard. Asahel, the brother of Joab, was also one of the thirty. Others were Elhanan, son of Dodo from Bethlehem, Shammah from Herod, Elika from Herod, Helez from Palti, Ira, son of Ikesh from Tekoa, Abiezer from Anathoth, Mabanai from Hushath, Zalman from Aho, Meherai from Netapha, Heleb, son of Baana from Netapha, Itai, son of Ribai, from Gibeah, of the tribe of Benjamin, Benaiah of Pirathon, Hidei from the brooks of Gaash, Abialban from Arbath, Asmaveth from Bahurim, Eliaba from Shealban, the sons of Jashan, Jonathan, Shema from Herar, Ahiam the son of Sherar from Herar, Eliphalet son of Ahasbei from Maaka, Eliam the son of Ahithophel from Gilo, Hezro from Carmel, Peareai from Arba, Igel son of Nathan from Zobah, Benai from Gad, Zelak from Ammon, Nehaerai from Beirath, the armor bearer of Joab, son of Zeruiah, Ira from Ithra, Gareb from Ithra, Uriah the Hittite, thirty seven in all. Chapter twenty four. Once again the anger of the Lord flared against Israel, and David was moved to harm them by taking a national census. The king said to Joab, commander-in-chief of his army, Take a census of all the people from one end of the nation to the other, so that I will know how many of them there are. But Joab replied, God grant that you will live to see the day when there will be a hundred times as many people in your kingdom as there are now. But you have no right to rejoice in their strength. But the king's command overcame Joab's remonstrance. So Joab and the other army officers went out to count the people of Israel. First they crossed the Jordan and camped at Aurora, south of the city that lies in the middle of the valley of Gad, near Jazer. Then they went to Gilead in the land of Tatim Hadshai, and to Dan Jaen, and around to Sidon, and then to the stronghold of Tyre, and all the cities of the Hivites and Canaanites, and south to Judah as far as Beersheba. Having gone through the entire land, they completed their task in nine months and twenty days. And Joab reported the number of the people to the king, 800,000 men of conscription age in Israel, and 500,000 in Judah. But after he had taken the census, David's conscience began to bother him, and he said to the Lord, What I did was very wrong. Please forgive this foolish wickedness of mine. The next morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, who was David's contact with God. The Lord said to Gad, Tell David that I will give him three choices. So Gad came to David and asked him, Will you choose seven years of famine across the land, or to flee for three months before your enemies, or to submit to three days of plague? Think this over and let me know what answer to give to God. This is a hard decision, but it is better to fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great then into the hands of men. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel that morning, and it lasted for three days, and 70,000 men died throughout the nation. But as the death angel was preparing to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was sorry for what was happening and told him to stop. He was by the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite, at the time. When David saw the angel, he said to the Lord, Look, I am the one who has sinned. What have these sheep done? Let your anger be only against me and my family. That day, Gad came to David and said to him, Go and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aron of the Jebusite. So David went to do what the Lord had commanded him. When Arana saw the king and his men coming towards him, he came forward and fell flat on the ground with his face in the dust. Why have you come? To buy your threshing floor, so that I can build an altar to the Lord, and he will stop the plague. Use anything you like. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and you can use the threshing instruments and ox yokes for wood to build a fire on the altar. I will give it all to you. 
and may the Lord God accept your sacrifice. But the king said to Arana, No, I will not have it as a gift. I will buy it, for I don't want to offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. So David paid him for the threshing floor and the oxen. And David built an altar there to the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the Lord answered his prayer, and the plague was stopped. First Kings, chapter 1. In his old age, King David was confined to his bed, but no matter how many blankets were heaped upon him, he was always cold. His aides told him, The cure for this is to find a young virgin to be your concubine and nurse. She will lie in your arms to keep you warm. So they searched the country from one end to the other to find the most beautiful girl in all the land. Abishag from Shunem was finally selected. They brought her to the king, and she lay in his arms to warm him, but he had no sexual relations with her. At about that time, David's son, Adonijah, his mother was Haggith, decided to crown himself king in place of his aged father. So he hired chariots and drivers and recruited 50 men to run down the streets before him as royal footmen. Now his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, not so much as by a single scolding. He was a very handsome man and was Absalom's younger brother. He took General Joab and Abiathar the priest into his confidence, and they agreed to help him become king. But among those who remained loyal to King David and refused to endorse Adonijah were the priests Zadok and Benaiah, the prophet Nathan, Shimei, Rei, and David's army chiefs. Adonijah went to Enrogel, where he sacrificed sheep, oxen, and fat young goats at the serpent's stone. Then he summoned all of his brothers, the other sons of King David, and all the royal officials of Judah, requesting that they come to his coronation. But he didn't invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the loyal army officers, or his brother Solomon. Then Nathan the prophet went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and asked her, Do you realize that Haggith's son Adonijah is now the king, and that our Lord David doesn't even know about it? If you want to save your own life and the life of your son Solomon, do exactly as I say. Go at once to King David and ask him, My Lord, didn't you promise me that my son Solomon would be the next king and would sit upon your throne? Then why is Adonijah reigning? And while you are still talking with him, I'll come and confirm everything you've said. So Bathsheba went into the king's bedroom. He was an old, old man now, and Abishag was caring for him. Bathsheba bowed low before him. He asked her, What do you want? My lord, you vowed to me by the Lord your God that my son Solomon would be the next king and would sit upon your throne. But instead, Adonijah is the new king and you don't even know about it. He has celebrated his coronation by sacrificing oxen, fat goats, and many sheep and has invited all your sons and Abiathar the priest and General Joab but he didn't invite Solomon. And now, my lord the king, all Israel is waiting for your decision as to whether Adonijah is the one you have chosen to succeed you. If you don't act, my son Solomon and I will be arrested and executed as criminals as soon as you are dead. While she was speaking, the king's aides told him, Nathan the prophet is here to see you. Nathan came in and bowed low before the king and asked, My lord, have you appointed Adonijah to be the next king? Is he the one you have selected to sit upon your throne? Today he celebrated his coronation by sacrificing oxen and fat goats and many sheep and has invited your sons to attend the festivities. He also invited General Joab and Abiathar the priest. And they are feasting and drinking with him and shouting, Long live King Adonijah! But Zadok the priest and Benaiah and Solomon and I weren't invited. Has this been done with your knowledge? For you haven't said a word as to which of your sons you have chosen to be the next king. Call Bathsheba, David said. So she came back in and stood before the king. And the king vowed, As the Lord lives, who has rescued me from every danger, 
I decree that your son, Solomon, shall be the next king and shall sit upon my throne, just as I swore to you before by the Lord God of Israel. Then Bathsheba bowed low before him again and exclaimed, Oh, thank you, sir. May my lord the king live forever. Call Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah. When they arrived, he said to them, Take Solomon and my officers to Gihon. Solomon is to ride on my personal mule, and Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet are to anoint him there as king of Israel. Then blow the trumpets and shout, Long live King Solomon! When you bring him back here, place him upon my throne as the new king, for I have appointed him king of Israel and Judah. Amen! Praise God! replied Benaiah, and added, May the Lord be with Solomon as he has been with you, and may God make Solomon's reign even greater than yours. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, and David's bodyguard took Solomon to Gihon, riding on King David's own mule. At Gihon, Zadok took a flask of sacred oil from the tabernacle and poured it over Solomon. And the trumpets were blown, and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon! Then they all returned with him to Jerusalem, making a joyous and noisy celebration all along the way. Adonijah and his guests heard the commotion and shouting just as they were finishing their banquet. Joab demanded, What's going on? Why is the city in such an uproar? And while he was still speaking, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar the priest, rushed in. Adonijah said to him, Come in, for you are a good man. You must have good news. Our Lord King David has declared Solomon as king. The king sent him to Gihon with Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah, protected by the king's own bodyguard. And he rode on the king's own mule. And Zadok and Nathan have anointed him as the new king. They have just returned, and the whole city is celebrating and rejoicing. That's what all the noise is. Solomon is sitting on the throne, and all the people are congratulating King David, saying, May God bless you even more through Solomon than he has blessed you personally. May God make Solomon's reign even greater than yours. And the king is lying in bed, acknowledging their blessings. He is saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has selected one of my sons to sit upon my throne while I am still alive to see it. Then Adonijah and his guests jumped up from the banquet table and fled in panic, for they were fearful for their lives. Adonijah rushed into the tabernacle and caught hold of the horns of the sacred altar. When word reached Solomon that Adonijah was claiming sanctuary in the tabernacle and pleading for clemency, Solomon replied, If he behaves himself, he will not be harmed. But if he does not, he shall die. So King Solomon summoned him, and they brought him down from the altar. He came to bow low before the king, and then Solomon curtly dismissed him. Go on home. Chapter 2 As the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I am going where every man on earth must someday go. I am counting on you to be a strong and worthy successor. Obey the laws of God and follow all his ways. Keep each of his commands written in the law of Moses so that you will prosper in everything you do, wherever you turn. If you do this, then the Lord will fulfill the promise he gave me that if my children and their descendants watch their step and are faithful to God, one of them shall always be the king of Israel. My dynasty will never end. Now, listen to my instructions. You know that Joab murdered my two generals, Abner and Amasa. He pretended that it was an act of war, but it was done in a time of peace. You are a wise man and will know what to do. Don't let him die in peace. But be kind to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite. Make them permanent guests of the king, for they took care of me when I fled from your brother Absalom. And do you remember Shimei, the son of Gerah, the Benjaminite, from Bahurim? He cursed me with a terrible curse as I was going to Mahanaim. But when he came down to meet me at the Jordan River, I promised I wouldn't kill him. But that promise doesn't bind you. You are a wise man, and you will know how to arrange a bloody death for him. Then David died and was buried in Jerusalem. He had reigned over Israel for 40 years 
seven of them in Hebron, and thirty-three in Jerusalem. And Solomon became the new king, replacing his father David, and his kingdom prospered. One day Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to see Solomon's mother Bathsheba. Have you come to make trouble? No, I come in peace. As a matter of fact, I have a favor to ask of you. What is it? Everything was going well for me, and the kingdom was mine. Everyone expected me to be the next king. But the tables are turned, and everything went to my brother instead, for that is the way the Lord wanted it. But now I have just a small favor to ask of you. Please don't turn me down. What is it? Speak to King Solomon on my behalf, for I know he will do anything you request and ask him to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. All right, I'll ask him. So she went to ask the favor of King Solomon. The king stood up from his throne as she entered and bowed low to her. He ordered that a throne for his mother be placed beside his. So she sat at his right hand. I have one small request to make of you. I hope you won't turn me down. What is it, my mother? You know I won't refuse you. Then let your brother Adonijah marry Abishag. Are you crazy? If I were to give him Abishag, I would be giving him the kingdom, too, for he is my older brother. He and Abiathar, the priest, and General Joab would take over. Then King Solomon swore with a great oath, May God strike me dead if Adonijah does not die this very day for this plot against me. I swear it by the living God who has given me the throne of my father David and this kingdom he promised me. So King Solomon sent Benaiah to execute him and he killed him with a sword. Then the king said to Abiathar the priest, Go back to your home in Anathoth. You should be killed too, but I won't do it now. For you carried the ark of the Lord during my father's reign, and you suffered right along with him in all of his troubles. So Solomon forced Abiathar to give up his position as the priest of the Lord, thereby fulfilling the decree of Jehovah at Shiloh concerning the descendants of Eli. When Joab heard about Adonijah's death, Joab had joined Adonijah's revolt, though not Absalom's. He ran to the tabernacle for sanctuary and caught hold of the horns of the altar. When news of this reached King Solomon, he sent Benaiah to execute him. Benaiah went into the tabernacle and said to Joab, The king says to come out. No, I'll die here. So Benaiah returned to the king for further instructions. Do as he says. Kill him there beside the altar and bury him. This will remove the guilt of his senseless murders from me and from my father's family. Then Jehovah will hold him personally responsible for the murders of two men who were better than he. For my father was no party to the deaths of General Abner, commander-in-chief of the army of Israel, and General Amasa, commander-in-chief of the army of Judah. May Joab and his descendants be forever guilty of these murders. And may the Lord declare David and his descendants guiltless concerning their deaths. So Benaiah returned to the tabernacle and killed Joab. And he was buried beside his house in the desert. Then the king appointed Benaiah as commander-in-chief and Zadok as priest instead of Abiathar. The king now sent for Shimei and told him, Build a house here in Jerusalem and don't step outside the city on pain of death. The moment you go beyond Kidron Brook, you die. And it will be your own fault. All right. Whatever you say. So he lived in Jerusalem for a long time. But three years later, two of Shimei's slaves escaped to King Achish of Gath. When Shimei learned where they were, he saddled a donkey and went to Gath to visit the king. And when he had found his slaves, he took them back to Jerusalem. When Solomon heard that Shimei had left Jerusalem and had gone to Gath and returned, he sent for him and demanded, Didn't I command you in the name of God to stay in Jerusalem or die? You replied, very well, I will do as you say. Then why have you not kept your agreement and obeyed my commandment? And what about all the wicked things you did to my father, King David? May the Lord take revenge on you. But may I receive God's rich blessings, and may one of David's descendants always sit upon this throne. Then at the king's command, Benaiah took Shimei outside and killed him. So Solomon's grip upon the kingdom became secure. Chapter 3 Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married one of his daughters. He brought her to Jerusalem to live in the city of David until he could finish building his palace and the temple and the wall around the city. 
At that time, the people of Israel sacrificed their offerings on altars in the hills, for the temple of the Lord hadn't yet been built. Solomon loved the Lord and followed all of his father David's instructions, except that he continued to sacrifice in the hills and to offer incense there. The most famous of the hilltop altars was at Gibeon, and now the king went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. The Lord appeared to him in a dream that night and told him to ask for anything he wanted, and it would be given to him. Solomon replied, You were wonderfully kind to my father David because he was honest and true and faithful to you and obeyed your commands. And you have continued your kindness to him by giving him a son to succeed him. Oh, Lord, my God, now you have made me the king instead of my father David. But I am as a little child who doesn't know his way around. Here I am among your own chosen people, a nation so great that there are almost too many people to count. Give me an understanding mind so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. For who by himself is able to carry such a heavy responsibility? The Lord was pleased with his reply and was glad that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So he replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people, and haven't asked for a long life or riches for yourself or the defeat of your enemies. Yes, I'll give you what you asked for. I will give you a wiser mind than anyone else has ever had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you didn't ask for, riches and honor. And no one in all the world will be as rich and famous as you for the rest of your life. And I will give you a long life if you follow me and obey my laws as your father David did. Then Solomon woke up and realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem and went into the tabernacle. And as he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, he sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. Then he invited all of his officials to a great banquet. Soon afterwards, two young prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. Sir, we live in the same house, just the two of us, and recently I had a baby. When it was three days old... This woman's baby was born, too. But her baby died during the night when she rolled over on it in her sleep and smothered it. Then she got up in the night and took my son from beside me while I was asleep and laid her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. And in the morning, when I tried to feed my baby, it was dead. But when it became light outside, I saw that it wasn't my son at all. It certainly was her son, and the living child is mine. No, no. The dead one is yours, and the living one is mine. And so they argued back and forth before the king. Then the king said, Let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim the living child, and each says that the dead child belongs to the other. All right, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought to the king. Then he said, Divide the living child in two and give half to each of these women. Then the woman who really was the mother of the child and who loved him very much cried out, Oh, no, sir. Give her the child. Don't kill him. But the other woman said, All right. It will be neither yours nor mine. Divide it between us. Then the king said, Give the baby to the woman who wants him to live, for she is the mother. Word of the king's decision spread quickly throughout the entire nation, and all the people were awed as they realized the great wisdom God had given him. Chapter 4 Here is a list of King Solomon's cabinet members. Azariah, son of Zadok, was the high priest. Elihoreph and Ahijah, sons of Shisha, were secretaries. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was the official historian and in charge of the archives. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was commander-in-chief of the army. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. Azariah, son of Nathan, was secretary of state. Zabud, son of Nathan, was the king's personal priest and special friend. Ahishar was manager of palace affairs. Adoniram, son of Abda, was superintendent of public works. There were also twelve officials of Solomon's court, one man from each tribe, responsible for requisitioning food from the people for the king's household. Each of them arranged provisions for one month of the year. The names of these twelve officers were Ben-Hur, whose area for this taxation was the hill country of Ephraim, 
Ben Dekir, whose area was Mekaz, Sha'albim, Beth Shemesh, and Ilan Beth Hanan. Ben Hesed, whose area was Arabah, including Soka and all the land of Hefer. Ben Abinadab, who married Solomon's daughter, the princess Tapheth, whose area was the highlands of Dor. Baana, son of Elihud, whose area was Teanak and Megiddo, all of Beth Shean near Zarathon below Jezreel, and all the territory from Beth Shean to Abel Maloha and over to Jachmium. Ben Geber, whose area was Ramoth Gilead, including the villages of Jair, the son of Manasseh, in Gilead, and the region of Argob in Bashan, including sixty walled cities with bronze gates. Ahinadab, the son of Ido, whose area was Mahanaim. Ahimaaz, who married Princess Basemoth, another of Solomon's daughters, whose area was Naphtali. Baena, son of Hushai, whose areas were Asher and Bialoth. Jehoshaphat, son of Parowa, whose area was Issachar. Shimei, son of Elah, whose area was Benjamin. Geber, son of Uri, whose area was Gilead, including the territories of King Sihon of the Amorites and King Og of Bashan. A general manager supervised these officials and their work. Israel and Judah were a wealthy, populous, contented nation at this time. King Solomon ruled the whole area from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines and down to the borders of Egypt. The conquered peoples of those lands sent taxes to Solomon and continued to serve him throughout his lifetime. The daily food requirements for the palace were 195 bushels of fine flour, 390 bushels of meal, 10 oxen from the fattening pens, 20 pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep, and from time to time deer, gazelles, roebucks, and plump fowl. His dominion extended over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates River, from Tifsa to Gaza, and there was peace throughout the land. Throughout the lifetime of Solomon, all of Judah and Israel lived in peace and safety, and each family had its own home and garden. Solomon owned 40,000 chariot horses and employed 12,000 charioteers. Each month, the tax officials provided food for King Solomon and his court, also the barley and straw for the royal horses in the stables. God gave Solomon great wisdom and understanding and a mind with broad interests. In fact, his wisdom excelled that of any of the wise men of the East, including those in Egypt. He was wiser than Ethan the Ezrahite, and Heman, Calco, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and he was famous among all the surrounding nations. He was the author of 3,000 proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs. He was a great naturalist with interest in animals, birds, snakes, fish, and trees from the great cedars of Lebanon down to the tiny hyssop which grows in cracks in the wall. And kings from many lands sent their ambassadors to him for his advice. Chapter 5 King Hiram of Tyre had always been a great admirer of David. So when he learned that David's son Solomon was the new king of Israel, he sent ambassadors to extend congratulations and good wishes. Solomon replied with a proposal about the temple of the Lord he wanted to build. His father David, Solomon pointed out to Hiram, had not been able to build it because of the numerous wars going on, and he had been waiting for the Lord to give him peace. But now the Lord my God has given Israel peace on every side. I have no foreign enemies or internal rebellions. So I am planning to build a temple for the Lord my God, just as he instructed my father that I should do. For the Lord told him, Your son, whom I will place upon your throne, shall build me a temple. Now... Please assist me with this project. Send your woodsmen to the mountains of Lebanon to cut cedar timber for me, and I will send my men to work beside them, and I will pay your men whatever wages you ask. For as you know, no one in Israel can cut timber like you Sidonians. Hiram was very pleased with the message from Solomon. Praise God for giving David a wise son to be king of the great nation of Israel, he said. Then he sent this reply to Solomon. I have received your message. And I will do as you have asked concerning the timber. I can supply both cedar and cypress. My men will bring the logs from the Lebanon mountains to the Mediterranean Sea and build them into rafts. We will float them along the coast to wherever you need them. Then we will break the rafts apart and deliver the timber to you. You can pay me with food for my household. 